Welcome to Mercy Medical Center's live webinar. Today we will be discussing oral cancer awareness and joining us is Dr. Jeffrey Crivett from the Physicians Clinic of Iowa. After his discussion, he will take questions from our audience. To submit your questions anytime during the discussion, go to the window in the upper right hand corner of your screen and type in your question. If you don't see the screen, click on the orange box with the white arrow. Your questions will be confidential. Well, welcome, Dr. Krivett. Let's get started. Thank you, Lynn. It's a pleasure being here. Well, for today's discussion, we're going to briefly discuss what is head and neck cancer, some statistics, signs and symptoms, risk factors. I'll describe our head and neck exam diagnostics, treatment, and prevention. Head and neck cancer is one of the most common yet preventable cancers. Head and neck cancers include cancers of the lips, mouth, tongue, pharynx or throat, and larynx or voice box. While most people are aware of the association with smoking and lung cancer, few realize that the use of tobacco products is also the number one cause of head and neck cancer. Among those who neither smoke or drink, this type of cancer is virtually non-existent. Over 70,000 Americans develop head and neck cancer each year. This represents about 5% of all cancers diagnosed this year, and nearly 15,000 of these people will die from these forms of cancer. Out of 70,000 cases of head and neck cancers diagnosed this year, 30% will, will involve cancers of the oral cavity. The diagnosis of oral cancer, of oral cavity cancer, is most common in men over 40 years of age. Laryngeal tumors are four to five times more common in men than women. However, incidence of this type of cancer in women has increased each year with the rise of women using tobacco products. Recently, there has been an increase in oral cancers in young males. This is thought due to the result of the rise in popularity of smokeless tobacco or snuff. There has also been an increase in oral cancers in young adults, and recent research attributes this to a rise in human papillomavirus, or HPV, transmitted through oral sex. Some signs and symptoms may include a sore in your mouth that doesn't heal or increases in size, persistent pain in your mouth, lumps or white uh, and dark patches, thickening of your cheeks, difficulties chewing or swallowing or moving your tongue, changes in your voice, a lump in your neck, and bad breath. A white patch that won't rub off develops uh, cancer about 4 to 18 percent of the time, and red patches can uh, develop cancer up to 20 to 30 percent of the time. Other signs and symptoms may include loosening of the teeth, dentures that no longer fit properly, trouble opening uh, your mouth, weight loss, and ear pain. Almost 30% of oral uh, cancer uh, patients show signs of uh, cancer in the lymph nodes or metastases in the initial evaluation. This excludes patients with hard palate and lip cancers. These two areas have a lower chance of developing cancer with spread to the lymph nodes. In contrast, the tongue has a very rich blood supply and lymphatic drainage which causes up to 60% of patients with tongue lesions to to develop some type of neck disease as well. For risk factors, there is a strong association between head and neck cancers and the use of any type of tobacco product. Studies show risk of malignancy is six times greater for smokers than non-smokers. Smoker, smoking is, re, is responsible for one in five deaths in the United States. It's estimated that the long-term life expectancy is decreased by 25% in folks who smoke. Tobacco is also a major risk factor in head and neck cancer. In studies, a direct relationship has been found between high alcohol intake and increased risk of oral cancers. Consuming alcohol and using tobacco products at the same time more than doubles the risk of, de of developing cancer. Studies have shown a strong relationship between alcohol abuse and laryngeal cancer as well. For laryngeal cancer symptoms, these may include difficulty swallowing, pain with swallowing, a sensation of a lump in the throat, 
ear pain, chronic cough, blood in the sputum, difficulties breathing, and of course, hoarseness. For a head neck exam, we ask about oral neck lesions, anything ab abnormal in your mouth or neck, any pain or bleeding, change in function. We discuss risky behaviors such as smoking and drinking. We then inspect and palpate for masses in the cervical lymph nodes, the thyroid, and salivary glands. Frequently, we use a hands-free light source or a mirror to do the examination. Then we perform a cranial nerve exam. We do an intraoral inspection and palpation, and we specifically focus on the lips, cheeks, and floor of mouth. And we wrap a, a tongue and gauze and retract to assess the lateral borders of the tongue, tonsillar pillars, hard palate, soft palate, and gingiva. The oral cavity examination should begin with the visual inspection and palpation of both upper and lower lips, and at the same time inspecting the gingival buccal sulcus and gum. Gentle pulling of the lower and upper lips will expose these areas. This area here. Raising the tongue will expose the floor of the mouth anteriorly. The area of great importance due to the relative high frequency of malignant lesions that are found here. The papilla of Stenson's duct and the ducts of the, of the frenulum are prominent structures inspected. Stenson's ducts are back here, and this duct right here is Warthin's duct, ducts that drain the submandibular gland. The floor of the mouth and the undersurface of the tongue should be inspected all the way from the anterior portion where the salivary ducts are to the back part of the mouth known as the retromolar trigone back here. A special area of attention is difficult uh, is, is in the back part of the floor of the mouth. And a lot of times we use two tongue depressors, one here and one in the cheek, to specifically look laterally and medially. The upper part of the upper gums are examined as well, and we very carefully look at the hard palate and soft palate. This slide shows the dorsal surface of the tongue. And we examine this by simply having the patient open uh, their mouth, or, or sometimes we use a tongue depressor. And we can examine the, uh, uh, the taste buds, uh, the uvula, and the soft palate. Bimanual pal palpation of the oral cavity, including the floor of mouth and base of tongue, is needed in order to feel hidden masses that could be present submucosally. Palpation of the salivary glands and lymph nodes should also be included as well. This is a slide showing a normal tongue. Filiform papillae are these structures that are small and have white tops. They are dispersed in the front part of the tongue with the heaviest concentration in the midline. These papillae function as licking elements and receptors of texture and pressure sensation. Nerve eddings originate from the fibers of the trigeminal nerve or fifth cranial nerve. Fungiform papillae are these larger uh, uh, taste buds, and they're also located in the anterior front of the tongue, the two-thirds of the tongue, but they're far less numerous than the filiform papillae. They are identified as little round smooth nubs scattered uh, along the surface of the tongue covered by filiform papillae. They function as taste buds, buds for the perception of salty and sweet foods, and they are innervated by the corda tympani, which is the branch of the seventh cranial nerve. In the back, we see the circumvallate papillae. They typically form an inverted V in the, uh, they, they form the junction between the oral tongue and the base of tongue, and there's about 8 to 12 of them. The circumvalid papillae contain a large number of taste buds with uh, the nerve endings coming from the ninth cranial nerve, and they're associated with the perception of bitter and sour taste. In this slide, the oral pharynx is seen, the soft palate, the tonsillar fossa, and the tongue base in the back. In the posterior pharyngeal wall, we see little lymphoid patches, which can be normal. Also with our exam, we use uh, two instruments to examine the upper oral digestive tract. The first is a rigid endoscope, and they have very different angles, and we're able to specifically examine the structures of the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses. Below is a flexible fiber optic laryngoscope that allows us to examine the nose, the oral pharynx and larynx. We typically put this through the nose after we anesthetize the nose. We're able to get a panoramic view 
of these structures and especially the larynx. It's very useful in folks with a gag reflex. Following uh, our complete examination, if necessary, we perform diagnostic x-rays. Specifically, most of the time we order CAT scans and MRIs to look at the anatomy in more of a three-dimensional fashion. When necessary, we could then do a biopsy. A small piece of tissue from the suspected lesion or tumor is taken and sent to a pathologist to define the type of cells making up the lesion or tumor. With tumors of the oral cavities, biopsies can be performed in the office. The surgeon may elect to do this in a hospital setting under an anesthetic as well, and this may help to define the size of the tumor and other tissues involved. The evaluation of the entire throat, voice box, and esophagus and windpipe are often recommended uh, as between 5 and 15 percent of people with a mouth, throat, or larynx tumor may have a tumor elsewhere on the head and neck. And typically when we stage patients with uh, obvious squamous cell carcinoma in the head and neck, we do what's called a panned endoscopy, where we look at the voice box, we look into the esophagus, and we look into the windpipe looking for these other lesions. And then we could then effectively stage what we see. This is a slide showing the lower lip. This is called leukoplakia. The white patching is demonstrated in almost the entire lower lip. There's also some areas of redness as well, which we call erythroplasia. Areas of leukoplakia can be noted in this buccal fold with the habitual use of snuff. This is known as a snuff pouch. The corrugated areas of mucosa may extend through the buccal gutter due to saliva mixture with tobacco. This lesion may exist, may exist for years before malignant transformation. However, the average age of snuff dippers cancer is about 10 years sooner than other oral cavity uh, patients, oral, cav or oral cancer patients. This is a, an example of a patient uh, who has diffuse leukoplakia of the tongue in a smoker. In some cases, it's very difficult to determine between lichen planus, which is a nonspecific inflammation, and from leukoplakia, therefore a biopsy is needed. In this slide, we see extensive areas of leukoplakia involving the entire anterior floor of mouth. The limits of the lesion are well defined. The entire lesion seems to be surrounded by and resting in an erythematous plaque, this red, red uh, material here. Biopsies of this demonstrated severe leukoplakia, severe dysplasia. Management of these lesions may be uh, more complex due to the involvement of the salivary ducts in the front and uh, may also impair tongue mobility. This is severe lichen planus uh, plaque of the oral tongue. It's a well-defined lesion, the upper surface of the tongue. It's surrounded by uh, characteristic lacy atrophic focus of lingual epithelium. These areas show marked inflammation with epithelial hyperplasia towards the tip of the tongue. And uh, in this uh, particular case, reticulated lichen planus was also observed in the cheeks as well, a nonspecific inflammation. This is a patient that has uh, lichen planus that is dysplastic with an early squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue, this white area right here. And this patient typically is treated uh, by excision, partial glossectomy. This is a very common lesion we see in our office. This is a lower uh, lip of a heavy cigarette smoker that shows areas of mild leukoplakia and invasive multicentric neoplastic lesion with ulceration and bleeding. This entire area right here is lip cancer, which requires resection. About 2 to 5 percent of all malignancies in men are diagnosed in the oral cavity. Unfortunately, most of these lesions are detected by patients themselves when they become symptomatic and therefore advanced. The advanced stage, which these tumors are commonly found, create disappointing treatment results. Treatment varies depending on the size of the tumor, anatomic location, and regional spread. Conventional treatment usually involves surgical resection or radiotherapy alone for small lesions, surgery combined with postoperative radiation for advanced lesions, or now we're doing chemotherapy and radiation uh, therapy combined for advanced lesions primarily. Squamous cell carcinomas are by far the uh, majority of these malignant tumors. These are aggressive, rapidly growing lesions. Rate of metastases depend on the size and anatomic location. Adenocarcinomas of the oral cavity are far less 
common tumors originating in the minor salivary glands which occur throughout, throughout the oral cavity. Usually they are recognized as abnormal submucosal swelling or occasionally they may become ulcerative. The most common are adenoid cystic and mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Melanomas of the oral cavity are rare and highly aggressive tumors. They present as dark mucosal lesions, often multicentric. This is a locally aggressive and early metastasizing tumor requiring prompt surgical treatment. Prognosis of mucosal melanoma is poor despite adequate treatment and perhaps due to the unusually late discovery we find these patients. Primary lymphomas of the oral cavity are uncommon and usually seen around Waldire's ring, which is the ring where the tonsils, adenoids, and lingual tonsils are. A well-differentiated uh, B-cell type lymphoma, which possesses specific markers and good prognosis, has been specifically described as developing in mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue or malt lymphomas. Oral cavity lymphomas can be present anywhere submucosally presenting as a mass or diffuse swelling. Early detection of malignant tumors is crucial since the size of the lesion is decisive for survival. Malignant tumors in their early phase may mimic benign lesions. Therefore, diagnosis by biopsy of any suspicious mass, nodule, or, ul or ulceration in the oral cavity is mandatory, even if asymptomatic. This slide shows a squamous cell carcinoma in the middle part of a mandible in an edentulous patient. Here's a tumor here. This is the gums right here. The tumor involves the gum in both the buccal, which is the outside, and the lingual surface of the uh, mandible. And when resected, the pathology, the, patho the pathology report showed a superficial invasion of the bone as well. This slide shows a squamous cell carcinoma in the upper gum here and here, in an area where uh, it, uh, in the interdental papillae between the teeth. There is evidence of a recent adjacent molar extraction. Isolated dental extractions in the presence of a neoplastic condition is not, is not advisable due to the possibility of involvement of the neoplasia in the dental socket would spread to the contiguous bone marrow. This is a highly keratotic exophytic lesion of the lateral tongue. Clinically, it's difficult to distinguish this from a squamous cell carcinoma. Marginal biopsies of the lesion showed a pattern of invasion. And this is a uh, picture of a uh, verrucous carcinoma of the tongue. It's a very elevated and white, irregular uh, lesion. Uh, typically, this is treated by, sur by, su by surgery as well. So with treatment, there are key members of our team. These include a head and neck surgeon, and frequently we are also reconstructive facial plastic surgeons as well, radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, speech pathologist, dentist and or maxillofacial prosthodontist, a dietitian, physical therapist, psychologist and or oncology social worker. The mainstay of treatment for head and neck cancers include surgery, radiation, these can be used alone or in combination with chemotherapy. And frequently, nowadays, with advanced lesions, we can go directly to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So for prevention, in summary, <clears throat> one should not use tobacco products, which includes cigarettes, cigars, dip, snuff, and chew. We should refrain, refrain from heavy use of alcohol, protect yourself from too much sun exposure, Sunlight increases the risk of facial cancer, especially the lips. Avoid exposure to environmental toxins, asbestos, certain metals, nickel and cadmium, wood dust and paint fumes, and control stomach acid. Even if you don't have heartburn, acid arising from the stomach reflux can harm throat tissues. We commonly see this in folks with lumps in the throat or globus pharyngeus. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Krivett. That was very interesting, and the, the um, photos were also very helpful. Uh, to remind you, Ms. Bear, can you hear me? Please. Uh, to, um, to remind you, your questions can be submitted from the box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. 
Uh, you can just type in the question and I will ask the question of, of Dr. Kreva. Okay, our first question, Dr. Krivet, are the early symptoms always painful? That's a great question, Lynn. Uh, frequently, uh, the early symptoms are just a white mass in your mouth uh, or a slight irregularity that you may feel. And very frequently, these are determined by your semiannual dental exam. So when I said earlier, any suspicious lesions that are found should be evaluated and possibly biopsied. We have um, another question. Is the risk always, or is the, excuse me, is the risk reduced if the smoker quits smoking? Yes, typically the risk is dramatically reduced uh, when you quit smoking and all the carcinogenic effects of, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, tobacco reverses and uh, the risk is dramatically reduced. Uh, we have a couple questions here. Uh, what is your explanation for the recent rise in thyroid cancer in younger females and how easy is this detected? Well, in general, we have found an increase in thyroid cancer for everybody. And the most common reason that we're seeing increase in thyroid cancer in most people are, are the uses of other types of imaging uh, services to look for other parts of the body. Commonly, we see incidental thyroid cancers in folks that are getting carotid uh, ultrasounds in older patients. Uh, in younger uh, people, I don't have any data showing that there's a marked increase in thyroid cancer, but we are seeing that thyroid cancer is one of the more rapidly increasing cancers that we're finding, and I think a lot of it is uh, we're finding them when we couldn't see or feel them before, and that's from other imaging studies such as MRIs and, and ultrasounds. Right. Uh, Dr. Cooper, what percentage um, does your chance of con contracting oral cancers go down if you abstain or cut down on your alcohol usage and quit? I don't have the exact number, but I do know that it helps tremendously to reduce risk because of reducing the exposure of the carcinogens to the uh, tissues of the oral cavity. It doesn't go to zero, but it drops dramatically. A related question about that, you said that there is an increased risk if there is both high alcohol use and tobacco. Why is this? Well, both, instead of having an additive uh, uh, product of causing cancer, it's multiplicative. Typically, um, folks that uh, drink alcohol, this is converted to acetaldehyde, and this causes uh, uh, the DNA in our cells uh, to be damaged and uh, causes uh, problems uh, in causing cancer. Furthermore, in, uh, tobacco has over 300 carcinogens in smoke. Specifically, we see chemicals such as aromatic hydrocarbons, benzopyrenes, and uh, tobacco-specific nitrosamines that act locally on, keratic on keratocyte stem cells. Uh, and uh, this, uh, both of these together uh, is multiplicative in causing uh, cancer of the arrow of the upper aural digestive tract. All right, um, Dr. Cook, can you please discuss the risk of oral cancers associated with HPV and is this risk increasing? In fact, uh, HPV is becoming uh, a very common cause of oral cancer. Uh, and in the United States, HPV is expected to replace tobacco as the main causative an, uh, agent in the future for the cause of oral cancer. We specifically see a specific protein uh, uh, mutation related to uh, the presence of this uh, virus. In 1988, 0 0.8 out of 100,000 uh, patients got oral cancer. In 2004, it's 2.6 out of 100,000. And I'm sure more, it's uh, more now. What about secondhand smoking issues? Well, secondhand smoking issues can also cause cancer because of the carcinogens in the smoke. Uh, it's not going to be as intense as one smokes, but there are reports of increased 
cancers and lungs and uh, other areas related to just exposure uh, to the carcinogens in the smoke. What is the um, survival rate for oral cancers? Have those statistics there? Typically, uh, survival is, uh, in oral cancer is related to the size of the tumor. In early stage cancers, uh, T1 and T2, the T1 tumor is less than 2 centimeters, and T2 is between 2 and 4 centimeters. The survival for 5 years is about 70%. As the tumor increases, the survival uh, drops to about 50%. Uh, the lesion is greater than 4 centimeters. In stage 4, or, uh, stage four tumors, when the T4, when the uh, tumor involves bone, skin, and other areas of the uh, head and neck, the, su the survival drops to 35%. When there are metastases in the neck, the, s the survival drops an additional 50% from those numbers. We have a couple questions um, about HPV. Does oral sex increase the risk of getting an HPV-related oral cancer? That's an excellent question, and the uh, current research suspects that this is the case. We don't have any hard data uh, yet, but we think that there's an increase of uh, specifically oral cancer uh, uh, of uh, HPV subtype 16 and 6 associated with cancers of the oral cavity. Uh, we're not certain if Garnasil is going to reduce this. There's some ab advocates now for even uh, va vaccinating young uh, boys with this as well. We know that it's definitely indicated for cervical cancer, but the uh, head and neck uh, literature is showing an increased incidence of HPV, in, particularly in, in folks that don't smoke. Can a teenage boy or girl who are already sexually active receive an HPC vaccination, and do you recommend this? Again, the uh, literature isn't out there yet. Uh, we don't have any studies showing that if you uh, obtain the vaccine that it's going to reduce oral cancer. And typically the healthcare providers that are administering the vaccine are pediatricians. Uh, that research is still in, in, uh, in process, but uh, my guess is that it would. Uh, do I need a physician's referral to be seen in your office, Dr. Krivett? No, we see uh, uh, a lot of patient-to-patient uh, -patient referral in our office, and, uh, uh, and we get plenty of referrals uh, from dentists and other health care providers, but we, we take all people that call. I believe we have covered all questions submitted to us, but if you have concerns about oral cancer symptoms, Dr. Umkrivet recommends, as he mentioned, that you check with your dentist first. Uh, Dr. Krivitz's office is located across 8th Avenue from Mercy's Emergency Department. And to schedule an appointment, his office number is 319-399-2022. Uh, another question has come in, Dr. Krivitz. Are there any free screenings available in town? Well, our office has been uh, involved with the uh, Head and Neck Cancer Alliance, which is a nationwide group of uh, health care providers that provide fr free screenings. Typically, this is done in the spring, and it's uh, advertised through our office. I just did a, a free screening at Mercy Medical Center in October, so I just checked the uh, newspapers and announcements, but typically this occurs uh, in the spring, and if you call our office, we'd be able to tell you the, the exact date that we're going to do this. Now, generally, we take questions, but we had a comment. Um, Dr. Griffith, great job, and this is coming from a current patient, so that's always nice to hear. Now, I know we had several questions related to HPV, and if anyone is interested in a little more information, Dr. Petroche participated in a webinar with us several months ago, and if you go to our website, um, www.mercycare.org forward slash live, you'll be able to access her, um, her webinar with additional questions or additional answers. Our next webinar is Depression and Seasonal Affective Disorder with Alyssa Drury as counselor with Mercy Family Counseling. It will be Thursday, January 19th at noon, and Alyssa will take your questions live after her discussion. I'm going to check to make sure that we don't have any more 
questions coming in at the last minute, um, and I don't believe we do. So thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Dr. Krivett.